Right, we are beginning our discussion right now and we are gonna be looking at more Taylor polynomials. Um, the remainder term, right, so we must be in 5.1.2, uh, be in a position to use the remainder um, Rn zero of f of x equals this. This is extremely important because um, it is giving the name of these R subscript N comma zero F of X term. But most importantly, it is giving the general formula for the remainder. So these R subscript N comma zero F of X equals this, gives the actual general formula for the remainder term. Not all the exams do this. And therefore, this is an opportunity to take note of the remainder term formula. Right, first things first, 5.1.1 is what we need to first solve. Right, so we are given the function um, f of x equals x times e to the minus x. And what is the question? We are also derive the Taylor polynomial of degree n in sigma notation. And so, this is how we proceed. Right, to find the Taylor polynomial of degree n in that form. You note, therefore, that this one here is about zero about zero. So we find the derivatives. So first we write f of x. Is x e to the minus x. Next, we find f prime. Right, the bread of the x is one. I'm leaving only x to the minus, uh, e to the minus x. Next, we actually find the derivative of, we keep x constant and the derivative of the exponential function. The exponential function always remains the same, but you multiply by the derivative of the top, the derivative of minus x is minus one. Giving us the exponential this, minus x e to the minus x. The second derivative is minus that, minus e to that, plus x e to that, minus e to that, plus x e to that. The third derivative. Right, the third derivative is going to be the same as you would find the derivative of this one, which is only 2e to the minus x. The derivative of the x is 1. Um, by the product rule here, we use the product rule here. And then we keep x constant this time around. We find the derivative of the exponential e to the minus x, which is e to the minus x. The derivative of the minus x is minus 1. And this gives us we add the like terms, uh, 2e to the minus x in that, which is 3e to the minus x, minus x, e to the minus x. One more derivative, the fourth, the fourth derivative. Right, to find the derivative of this one, which is minus 3e to the minus x, and then the derivative of the x is one, which is minus e to the minus x. The derivative of the exponential, the derivative of the exponential is this. This is minus, minus four, e to the minus x, minus x e to the minus x. Okay. Right, from this we're able to get f at zero is zero. F prime at zero is one. The double prime at zero is only gonna be minus two. The third 
derivative for the third derivative, this one. And write the same notation here. The third derivative, I've put, I've put it through on top here, so I'll maintain that. Right, for consistency of the notation, so it is 3 here. And this is exactly 3 there. The fourth derivative. Right, so we have the fourth derivative here. which is minus four, right? So now we need to derive the Taylor polynomial of degree n in sigma notation. Right, so we continue as follows. Then we write out the formula. So Tn zero. f of x f of 0 f prime at 0 f double prime at 0 triple prime This one. Okay. And then it goes on here because now you have the nth derivative of that. You have the nth derivative of that. Okay. Right, we have the nth derivative of that here. Right, so this is the nth derivative. Okay, so what do we get out of this? We substitute so that t in zero of f of x what is f of zero? Right, f of zero is zero. Okay, there's no need to put zero there. This derivative is one. So we shall have one x, this x. The second derivative is minus two. So that's minus two x squared over two factorial. The third derivative, three. The fourth derivative, minus four. Okay. Minus four. Right, so this is minus four, x to the fourth power over four factorial. And then the pattern looks very clear. It's positive, negative, positive, negative. You can even go on and say it's going to be 5x to the fifth power over 5 factorial. Plus dot, dot, dot. Plus. And then it is exactly n x to the power n divided by n factorial. But not only that, okay, 
now because the signs alternate so we need to take care of that but now when it's even then it's like this it's, it's, it's negative when it's odd it's positive when it's even it's negative uh, right so here obviously must be right that's extended but i need to get the and right so when it's odd then it's plus right and then plus make this negative okay right then we have one more right the last one is going to be minus one to the power something and then it's going to be x to that but they are let me write like this so it's going to be n first okay this n and then n is divided by n factorial and this x to the power n but this one let's see now it's always it's always when it's even it's negative when it's odd it's positive so it must be n plus one okay because if i just make this if we just make the power of the minus one only n then it's going to be when when the power is three odd it's going to become negative but if it's plus one then it, it actually creates wonderful alternation there okay so how far are we derive the theta polynomial of degree n in sigma notation like this like that so right so it must be of the form R equals one. R. Hey, they even missed the power, the, the brackets here. Hey, there must be brackets here, but this is the derivative. Uh, zero. X to the power R divided by R factorial. Okay, so it must be of this form, this derivative. See how far we are from this. How far are we from that? Right. We are well set. The general term is already there. So you can write this as T n0 f of that is exactly the summation the derivative n derivative is going to be minus one to the power n plus one okay n x to the power n over n factorial. Okay, so this is what we get. And these can be simplified. So a student, uh, okay. I need to write these differently, it's R here. Are there? Are they? Are they? <clears throat> R. We're getting R here. Then we're getting R factorial. And then we're getting R. And then we're getting R. Right. So obviously, you agree that now the R factorial generally is the same as what? R factorial. Okay. The same as R. And then you put r minus one, r minus two, and so on. R minus one factorial. 
And this means we can write this as the summation divided by R into R minus one factor. So R cancels. Okay, R minus one. Okay. So these are equivalent. These two are possible possible answers. Okay, they are possible answers. Where do we start with this? If R is one, we're checking if this is the correct sigma notation of that. So when R is one, you put one here, one factorial one, and then it becomes um, minus one squared, which is plus, and then it's X to the one. So when R is two, then it's two factorial, two here, and then it's two plus one uh, negative, which is minus one cubed when r is 2, and then it's x to the second power. OK, so this looks correct. OK, I feel I can think it is the correct one. So derive the Taylor polynomial of degree n in sigma notation, and we just did. We just did. We just did. Yes, please. And can you go back to the first, first line? OK. Uh, how do you get this? This this part. Okay, that's good. How do I get that part? Great. So um, to get that part, so we are actually just uh, performing differentiation. Um, given the function f of x, which is x by e to the minus x, the first derivative of which can be obtained using the product rule. What does the product rule state? The product rule simply says y equals fg means the derivative of this product dy dx is f primed d by f g primed. Okay. So, right, so we first differentiate x. Okay, because it is a product, so use the product rule. The derivative of x is 1. Okay, not going to write the one. The next, you keep x constant and find the derivative of the e. e remains the same. The exponential function always remains the same during differentiation, but you multiply by the derivative of the top with respect to x. The derivative of minus x is minus one. Right, further expansion and distribution leads to this. Next, now we must differentiate this part because we must get successive derivatives. So this was the first derivative, and now we need to get the second derivative. So we differentiate this one. Now we use a difference rule, because it's a difference um, of, uh, of functions. Right, so e to the minus x remains the same, but you multiply by the derivative of the minus x, which is minus one. Right, then what is the derivative of the x? The derivative of the minus x is minus one. Then you have e to the minus x. And then the, min the minus x, you keep it constant, then you multiply by the derivative of e to the minus x, which is e to the minus x times the derivative of the minus x, which is one. We have minus x e to the minus e to the minus x minus e to the minus x, which is minus two e to the minus x. Okay, so we just performed successive different uh, derivatives. Okay, I can always discuss that. Uh, right, so, but now then next we just uh, replace every x by zero. Why zero? Because it's t n t sub n comma zero. And now we replace x. x, f, x has been replaced in the function f it was f of x, but now is f the r r the derivative at zero. Okay, so x has been replaced by zero, we replace x by zero. But first we replace x by zero in the original function f which is of the zeroth, zeroth derivative. Okay, there's no differentiation yet. 
at this point, and we replace x by zero, and that would be zero by e to the minus zero. Okay, zero by that is going to be just become zero. Here we replace um, x by zero, which is e to the minus zero. This one, this one is going to be zero by whatever. It's going to become zero. So we're just left with one, and the, the, uh, no. substitutions are, are performed there to actually produce this. But now we actually have been able to get the correct. Um, yes, please, my dear. ZP, my dear. Okay, Yang's yeah, checker. Yang's yeah, checker, my dear. All right. All right. Okay, so we have this. And then now, when this is Tn, comma, zero, we get that one. Okay, now the next thing is we do the second part. We are still given the same function, but now we are just want to do the remainder. Right, so we need to use the remainder. This is the remainder. Where C lies between zero and X? C lies between zero and X, what does it mean? It means C lies between zero and X, like this. To show that this approaches zero, this N approaches infinity for fixed X. Okay. What do we do here? So this we already know. A couple of things we know, like we know already the, the formula, but we know the nth term. The nth term, this one here, is the, is the nth derivative. Right, so if this is the um, nth derivative, what is it? It means the nth derivative of the function of x. Okay, I need to just copy that one down. It is minus one to the power n plus one. Minus one to the power n plus one. Then what? N x, right. N x to the power n over n vectorial. Okay, this was the, the nth term of the derivative. Okay, then you have, you have this. Okay, so it is that because at the end, what we're getting here is we're just, we're just adding these here. We're just adding these here. Right, need to um, uh, mention something here. Let me not write this now. I'll write it, I'll tell you. Um, there is something else I want to write. But I need it. But first things first, I want us to write the, I want us to write the series we got. Right, the series we got. What series did we get? We need to check carefully here. We need to check carefully here. Right, so we have these. We have that. Um, I want us to, what is the R of the derivative in terms of, yeah, I want to write this one, for example. Okay, like we did last time. It helps to look at this pattern. Right, to make it a different color before I take it to the other side and to reason correctly. So, um, the end. Derivative. Okay, so if it's four here, then you have uh, four. But now you have um, 
it's it's alternating this it's alternating but now it's if it's um, the first derivative so the last ones are always x e x e to the power x x e to the power x but if it's the first then there's one here if it's the second derivative two so there are those patterns three three four four so what is the nth one in terms of as a function of x okay but you can see that the signs are not always the same. Okay, let me see here. Um, okay, um, let me see. Let me check here. Okay, this one is that. This is that. If I don't make a mistake here in the signs, I think this one must be plus. Okay, let's check. Uh, I think, yeah, this must be plus. Okay, um, I'll just read you now, but it must be plus. But it does not, it does not, it does not affect that answer because um, it is x times and x is zero. So it does not affect that answer. But um, obviously when I differentiated this one, it became the e to the minus x, it became uh, the e remains the same, you multiply by the derivative of the x, which is minus one. Right, and then here you, the derivative of the x is one, so you just have minus e. And then you have the minus x, you multiply by the derivative of that. So that's going to be minus 1. OK, making this a plus. So this side, these things here have opposite signs. But um, so we can write this general, the general derivative um, in many ways. Um, right, so what is the general derivative here? How else can it be? How can it be written in general? Right, so there's going to be an n, because if it's 4, then it's 4. There's going to be an n. Then there's e to the power minus x. Then there's going to be um, an x. OK, there's going to be an x, e to the minus x. Okay, what else do we have here? Okay, maybe we can write like these, but also we can also factorize the things. So we can also write minus that or x minus that, and then we can write e to the minus that. Um, and then here you can write three minus x, e to the minus x. Okay, I'm just looking at these now. And then you can write here x minus 2 e to the minus x. Here you can write 1 minus e to the minus x. Okay, that's just another presentation that can evoke a more compact way of writing this. So you always have those numbers there. But you can write it in expanded form anyhow. Right, so let's see if it's even, it's negative. If it's odd, it's positive. If it's even, it's negative. If it's odd, odd, first degree, it's one is odd and it's positive. So it means therefore this minus one to the n plus one. Yeah. Okay. And then now the other the the minus e the e the x e to the minus x is is x e to the minus x, but they are alternating. The, the signs alternate. If it's one, it's um it's negative. If it's two, it's positive. So it means that there is minus one to the power n. Right. So this is what we get. But yeah, it can be written like this as well. You can pull out the e um, to the minus x out, and this gives us n minus 1 to the n plus 1. And then it gives us plus minus 1 to the power n x. Can be written like this. OK, there are many ways, but your uh, all these methods will surely be correct. There are definitely correct ways of writing this whole thing here. OK. Um, 
what do we have now? This is what we get. Okay, uh, this is what I wanted to uh, agree is the derivative and therefore we can use it here. So I wanted to write it in the derivative of x, but I did not write it out in detail, or it is exactly that one, n. which is n into minus one. To the power n plus one, okay, copy the correct thing, plus minus one to the power n, then there's an x somewhere, Right, so there's an x e to the minus x. Okay, if this is the derivative again, it means when you change the ends, like if you, you can try these, the, the time here. if you change, if you make f, find f2, the second derivative, f2, when n is two, it must produce this. Does it produce this to check? So you put two here, there's a two there. And there's minus one. If it's two plus one is cubed, so it's minus. Right, and then you have minus one squared, which is plus. Then there's an x, there's e to the minus x. So yeah, so this is the correct general formula for the derivative. Why do we need it? We need it because this one here is gonna need the nth derivative, but we multiply it by x to the power n plus one. This is always the case, so this is, the general formula of, of, of the derivative. This is the formula of the remainder. And therefore you need to master it. You need to memorize it. You need to write it down in your notes. It's one of those formulas you need to know because it's gonna be there in the exam. So what is it? R subscript n comma zero f of x is um, f n plus one. Okay, the examiner just left some brackets here because the derivative, you must put some brackets around um, the power of the f. Okay, right. So what is the meaning of this? Well, the meaning of this is that R subscript N zero, F of X is gonna be, right, right now we write the F of N plus phase derivative. So you replace every N by N plus one here. That one is easy, right? So you have N plus one, and then you have, um, what have I done here? <laughs> right, I've written an extra n. Right, I've written an extra n. So it must be n plus one minus one. All right, so you have n plus one, then we have n plus two plus, and then you have minus one to the n plus one x. Okay, so we continue. We continue. So what do we get out of these? Uh, we are, I've, I've just replaced n by n plus one there. So I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close here because there are square parentheses there. And then you have the e to the minus x. So this is the f, uh, f to the nth derivative. But now then we have this. Okay. Um, and then now, I just need to replace every x by what? By c here. So I'm just writing x there, but let me just replace it by c once and for all. So this x must be replaced by c, and this x must be replaced by c. In other words, this one must be c, and this one must be c. Good. And then you multiply these by x to the power n plus one, 
And this is exactly divided by n plus one. And you have this. Where C lies between zero and X. So C is between zero, between zero and X. Right, you need to show this. Okay, so we have this, this is what we need. But now we must take the absolute value of this. Right, because it is the absolute value that, so taking the modulus of this, and then we have the modulus of that. Okay, an interesting question, but it might even use the triangle inequality here because we have a sum. Uh, now we might wish to use the triangle inequality for the, for the sum to reach the, Um, to reach the individual terms, we shall see what we can do. And we have this. The absolute value normally needs to reach each of these terms to, if, to actually have a positive effect on the terms. And so, we're good. We can use the triangle inequality. Right, triangle inequality. What does the triangle inequality say? All right, triangle inequality. So we have this. So this is less than or equal to. So the n plus one is okay. Mm, I can even, you can put the absolute value here, but it's positive this. You just put round brackets around it. But the absolute value is going to make this one positive. And the n plus 1 as well. Okay, it's already positive. There's no need to. Um, right. Right, plus. And then here, this one, it's going to be the modulus of c. Okay, there are many ways to write this thing, but one factorial and then you have e to the minus c times x to the n plus one, like this. Okay. We have this. We have this. Okay, this is fine. Okay, it's less equal to because of the strength inequality. We have allowed the absolute the modulus to to have an effect on each of of the terms in the sum. So if it is if it affects each of the terms in the sum, then we have the triangle inequality like that. Okay. Now we are in a position to take the the limit of this. So we have the modulus Rn0 of x less than or equal to n plus 1. n plus 1, and then you can put some. Um, Absolute value bars there, vectorial. And then you have plus. Then you have C. N plus one. E to the minus C. Modulus um, n plus one. 
like this. Okay. Okay, continue. Continue. Right, so continuing now, we take the limit of this. Okay, before you even take the limit of that, this is the modular state, the modular is there. Uh, but C, but C lies between zero and X. But we agree that x is between 0 and 1. So you can always um, right, see the relationship between the, um, the c and the x. Um, let's take the limit. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity. Um, what do we do? Okay, which is n plus one, which is e to the minus c. N plus one. Right. And do some manipulations here. It moves. Right. So this one here is the same as N plus one. And remove the absolute value there. And write N plus one. Then you subtract one from that. It becomes N factorial because the Definition of the factorial is n, n minus one, n minus two, up to three to one. Uh, by definition, the factorial is defined like that. So then what we're getting here, we continue. We continue. Right, so this is exactly that n plus one, e that, so this is the limit, and I produce that, x um, to the n plus 1. As n approaches infinity, this one is going to be 0. But also, this is going to become 0. And this thing, because x lies between 0 and 1, is a fraction, is also going to be 0. The result is 0. Effectively, what we're saying is that the limit, yes, n approaches infinity of Rn0 is less or equal to 0. OK, as a consequence, what we're getting is therefore that The limit as n approaches infinity of r n zero f of x equals equals what? Equals zero. Well, I mean, it it is. This is equal to zero, but also the limit, the modulus is greater or equal to zero, but again, it is less than or equal to zero. So this is raising the argument that there is a number on the real line that is shown by the modulus. But this number lies between 0 and 0. What number lies between 0 and 0? It's 0 itself. So it means that this is 0. And now use the remainder theorem 
where C lies to show that this approach is zero in that prefix X. We've shown that. For it, where X lies between zero and one. Okay. Always like x lies between zero and one. Now consider the same function here. Right, the same function f of x, the Taylor series folding x at one is given by this. Use this to express this as a power series for this. Write the answer in sigma notation. Okay, we saw something like this and we I packet it again. So they've given us the Taylor series for of what? For lin x at one. Okay, that's why it's x minus one. It's at, at, at one. But it is on the interval one to two, closed and bounded interval. Use this to express this integral um, from um, one to x as a power series. Now you need a power series for it must go up to infinity. For x between one and two, write the answer in sigma notation. Okay, what do we do here? What do we do here? Mm -hmm. What do we do here? Okay, there's nothing much to do. Except that you need to realize something that these are functions of t. The t minus one is a function of t, and also the link t is a function of t uh, with respect to t dt. For if you use that to express these as a power series, or so you'll have that. You'll have that the integral one to x. lin t dt. What is lin t? What is lin t? Right, so you need to continue and write here one to x. And then you have t minus one. And then now you need to put this here. Right, you put this here in t. So if it's in t, wherever there is x, you put t here. So that will be the summation. R equals one. Minus one, r minus one. T. Minus one. R divided by r. Okay, we have just substituted the, the instant t. And then now we have dt. For this one here, see what you're getting out of this. You can write this one as the summation. Okay, so something like this earlier today. So we're good. Okay, um, so we continue. Um, we'll continue. I'm going to say something here. So now you need to pull out the summation. Pull out the summation. That's one way. Right, you pull out the summation, and then this is dt. The only thing you can pull out is the, you can pull out the r, so the r is out, the r in the denominator, and then what else is there? 
And then you just have the integral from one to x of p minus one to the power r plus one dt. Okay, this is everything here. Let me see. I think that everything is there. We just need to integrate this one. Right, to integrate this one here is the summation r equals one minus one to the power r minus one r p minus one r plus two divided by r plus two. r plus two, like this. But we're not done yet. So we have this, but this is from one to, to x, All right? So let's see now, we have the integral one to x, p minus one, Um, lin t dt, we already got something. The summation. R minus one. P minus one. Okay, let me see. P minus one. To the R plus what? Plus two. One to X. And then now, you can have the r plus 2 here coming out and sitting in this position. And then wherever there is t, you put the x first, which is x minus 1 r plus 2. Then next you put 1. Putting 1 here is just going to become 1, 0. So you only have this. Um, then you're done. So the result is this one. I hope I hope this is the correct. Uh, I hope they they did not the formula that we copied for the log is the does not even have the factorial. Okay, because now we we'll just uh, we see the scanned images. Okay, I'll just comment on that. So two here. There. So we have here x minus 1 to the power r plus 1. To the power r plus 1. Okay. Right. I'm just doing a cross check in terms of the. Um, um, these formulas we have in here. Right, in terms of the formulas we have in here. Right, so this must be just the answer to it. So um, just note, note that, note that, note that. Okay, note that. Right, right large it is, it, it looks, yeah, it is correct, it is correct. Right, so this is two. Right, this is true. Okay. But yeah, that is the method anyhow. So it means therefore now uh, for us to integrate this, 
which is T minus one, the lean of T dt is equal to this. Okay. And the question was, the Taylor series for that is given by these, use this to express this as a power series for x between one and two. Okay, and this is it. Right, the next thing now is about the Riemann um, integral. And obviously um, we have seen this before, but we're just practicing um, to make sure that we understand this. The question that is repeated a billion times has just been the, um, the Riemann integration. Um, state the criterion for a function f to be Riemann integrable on a closed and bounded interval. So we repeat this uh, as such, 6.1. We start by saying here, we actually let F be defined by, we defined on the closed interval AB, then F is Riemann integrable is Riemann integrable on AB if and only if, if and only if, right, for every Epsilon positive there exists a partition P of A B such that U of P, right, such that U of P minus L of P is less than Epsilon. Okay, and that is um, by and large how you need to state it in the exam. Right, so in 6.2, you have this quadratic. I just decided to pick this one because it's, it is actually having quadratic. And now it's just obviously of the partition there, it's pretty much the same partition all the time between zero and one, right, between zero and one. Calculate LPN, UPN, hint, the sum of the squares is this. So we actually note these things here, but I want to mention in passing, normally we use a couple of these um, formulas. Now, the formulas we use, like the sum of the squares um, are these. Okay, that's correct, the sum of squares. And then we have the sum of the cubes. This some of the cubes, okay, these formulas become useful when we are actually um, performing the integration. So um, it's very important to mention that. So we agree that the sum of the squares are exactly that one there. Okay, there's a typo. Uh, whatever did this here. Okay, it must be N, N, N to N, because it is exactly in terms of the last uh, last term. Okay, so um, just know that one. Okay, we're just starting now. And then obviously I want to state also the formula for the cubes. Right, the sum of the cubes, we did the sum of the cubes um, 
um, last time. Right, the sum of cubes. Right, so in the sum of cubes is exactly something we did yesterday. And so what is the sum of the cubes? Right, right, right. I'm, I just want to write that in the formula so that we can have them. And then you can also note them and remember these. Okay, because first things first, you need to make sure that you have the sum of the cubes. Because when you are faced with the problem, what you do? You just uh, use the sum of the cubes formula um, to approach uh, the question. Okay, we did that one. Um, but now, um, right. Um, Right, so the sum of the cubes. Right, so this one must be n out of 6, n plus 1, to n plus 1. Okay, and then now I'm going to write the formulas here. I have lots of space. So the sum of k cubed, k equals 1 to n. Okay, it must be a function of n. For this one is exactly n into n plus one. You can prove this, but yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's cool work, it's my trick to prove this. Right, so we have n squared into n plus one squared, because these are just basic series. And then now, uh, it's mostly done in school, in high school to prove this. Right, Um, and then now, we continue. And then now, okay, we have the sum of the, the cubes are there. And then what about the sum of the natural numbers? The sum of um, integers, n integers, the sum of the n integers. Right, we did that one. And so um, we can always have that one. Okay, I'm gonna give the R. Right, so I'm just gonna write, I'm writing these things here. Right, the sum of the K when K is one, we use this all the time, to N. Okay, so this one is exactly n into n plus 1 over 2. Right, so we have written this. Depending on the, yeah, the examiners do not go high enough. They don't go, uh, because the aim is just to test the concept here. It's not um, to just, it's not fault hunting. So if you have k to the fourth power, k equals 1 to n, which is one over 30. Okay, this one has already been simplified. N to the fifth power plus 15 N to the fourth power plus 10 N cubed minus N. Okay, so, right, so some of the formulas that we use, okay, so just a note. Right, so we're back to the question now, and we're saying uh, we have this. So it's very important to analyze these and have a, a graphical representation of the function. This is a, a quadratic function from grade 10, uh, right? Because now the general one is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, I'm going to be a little bit faster to finish this off. Okay, but obviously we agree that the b term is zero here, making it a grade 10 question. Right, now, how does this graph look like? Okay, so it will have a maximum vertex, like this. I have a maximum vertex at four. It's gonna cut, I have two x intercepts at minus two, two. Okay, just analyzing this. Okay, it is very important. Between zero and one, between x equal to zero and x equal to one, the function is here. But clearly the function is decreasing. 
Okay, it's very important to note that the function is decreasing because if a function is decreasing, it means there is a point here that is x i minus one and f x i minus one. All right, so we have the next one is x i and then f x i, like this. Okay, so we have this. So we have this. Okay, so those are the kinds of things you need to know. But now, uh -huh. if the function is decreasing, which one is the infimum, which one is the supremum here? The supremum, the infimum, okay. Why am I even mentioning supremum and infimum? So, yes, okay, mentioning those. But now there's big M and small m, the notation we use. Okay, the big M is the supremum and the small m is the infimum. Right, so you have the capital M and then you have small m. Which one is the big M? Right, the big M is the at this point, it's going to be the one that occurs before, which is fxi minus 1. And then there's small m. Like this. All right. Okay, so we have this. Right, so we have this. Okay. So let's find um, the, so let's find first, which one? Right, so you choose the one that is easier to deal with, either LPN or UPN. But the one, the one that is easier is one that's not, that, that does not have a minus one, because the minus one also is going to add a term that's extra to simplify. So it's good to do that at the end. Let's do the easy one. Right, so we're gonna first do this um, M, small mi. There's fewer terms, a little bit. And the small mi is fxi, which is minus x, I squared because it's, 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 it's minus x squared plus four. And then what do we get out of this? Um, the partition, right. So the partition has this one. So these things are like I over N this. So this one, the xi is just going to be i over n plus 4. Goodness me. We get this one. And then now we note that our delta x is 1 over n. Hence, So the small mi is for the LPN, which is a summation. Right, summation of the small mi delta x. So i equals one, to n. Okay. All right, this is what we get. As a consequence, then we have this. Um, 
what is this? Okay, the, the small m i is there for this. i squared over n squared plus 4 delta x. Okay, we know the delta x already. What is the delta x already? The delta x is 1 over n. Is 1 over n. Ah, oh, 1 over n. Right, so it's 1 over n. Like this. Okay, so we're in business now, we can multiply through, etc. Um, the only variable here is i. Everything else can be taken out uh, outside the sign. So it's minus 1 over n cubed. The summation. Plus. 4 over n. 1. So you have this one. The sum of the cubes is this one, n squared. So n squared into n plus 1 squared over 4. Plus 4 over n. Uh, I equals 1 to n. Okay, you are adding the you're adding constants 1. So it's n by one. Um, right, so the n squared cancels the one n squared from the cube, giving us minus n plus one for n plus four. Right, so we have this. Okay, so we can do many things with this. We can write n squared minus 2n minus 1 plus 16n. Okay, just adding this things up. Right, so we have minus n squared plus 14n minus 1 over for n, this can be written as minus n over 4. Plus 7 over 2. Minus 1 over 4n. Right, the observation therefore is that our LPN Right, so the observation is that LPN is minus N over 4 See now. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, this is small typo. Uh, we can't have this n alone like this. Okay, because it's gonna be it's gonna approach infinity. This. I'm sorry, we must. Uh, um, have this one is n cubed. That arises from this is a cube, and this is squared from there. And the one over n is that, so that's a cube for sure. And then this one is going to cancel one, giving us only n minus the square. This one is going to have 
a higher um, order. Okay, I'm gonna check this up. Um, I'm gonna check this up, but yeah, my worry is this one here. Um, because if you simplify this, it's gonna be having an N there. Okay, I'm gonna check this. Let me do UPN. Right, you can be able to check the error. Right, so if you do UPN, use the summation up to N, I equals one, then you do the big M. Okay, so you have the summation. Okay, the big M is gonna be what? Mm, it's it's this one. Is this one? Which is exactly F X I minus one. Okay. So we have this. Okay, so I minus one is gonna be the same as one of these. Right, so it's gonna be I minus one over N. Squared minus plus four, that is the function. Okay, that is the function here. Um, right, that is the function. And then now the change is one over n. So what is this? Right, you multiply by the one over n. So it's gonna affect this one, it's gonna be, become a cube in the minus. So it's gonna become minus one over n cubed. The summation. Cube, uh, squared. Plus over n summation which is UPN. Minus one over n cubed. which is I squared minus two I plus one, and then four over N, the summation of that one is gonna be N by one. Okay, the UPN and LPN must differ by normally just the minus term, negative term. So this one is gonna be the summation of the i squared minus two, then we have the summation of the i plus the summation of the one constant term plus four over n, n by one. And then this is upn minus one over n cubed, Okay, now the sum of the squares. Okay, let me see what I need. What is sum of the cubes? Oh, here's the mistake I did. 
Okay, because this one is it should be i squared. Very cute. So we need to change this. You can see that this something is not balancing here. So I'm gonna just make it change here, please. Um because this sum is, is gonna be an unbounded sum, it's gonna uh, increase without bound, it's gonna reach infinity or negative infinity because of the typo. Right, as I said, if you multiply by n, it's gonna be n cubed, but the i is squared. But I can see that now I wrote a cube there. So it's gonna affect the answer. So um, it's gonna become a square here. Okay, it has been square. I'm wondering why I wrote a cube. n by n is that sort for the n, so it's okay. So now we're gonna have the sum of the squares. Which are these? N over six. N into N plus one into two N plus one divided by six. Right, so plus uh, 4 over n. Then here you have n by 1. So the n divides here. Using minus n plus 1 into 2n plus 1. Okay, so it is going to be 6n squared here. Plus 4. Multiply this and that, which is 2n squared, 2n squared plus n plus 2, 2n squared, no, plus n plus 2n, 3n, plus 1, divided by 6n squared, plus 4. And therefore this, if you divide, um, it's going to be minus 1 over 3 so from this. And then next, uh, uh, 3 divided by 6 is a half minus uh, 1 over 2n. Minus 1 over 6n squared plus 4. Right? So what do we get in here? Six n squared. Uh, min yeah. Four minus one third. Eleven. Out of three. Hey, this is perfect. It looks perfect, perfect. Are we going to see the other one? So now here we have the sum of the squares. n into n plus 1 to n plus 1 out of 6. This one is n into n plus 1 out of 2. n by 1. By a plus four. Right, we get this one. Mm, yeah. So what is all this here? Then write minus one over n cubed and delete the inside here. So uh, this one, so it's 2n squared plus 3n plus 1 out of 6 minus 
n squared minus n plus n plus 4 minus 1 over n cubed. Two n cubed. Three n squared plus n minus n squared. Minus one over n cubed. Mm -hmm. This is n cubed over three plus n squared over two n over six minus n squared. Where we have this minus one over n cubed n cubed over three um n squared over two let's see n over six minus n squared. Okay, so we have the n squared. I hope I copied everything correctly here. Okay, minus one over n cubed. And then now we have n squared over two minus n squared. So this is n cubed. Minus n squared over 2 plus n over 6 minus 1 over 3 plus this cancels out and then it becomes 1 over 2n. Minus one over six n squared. Let's take a chance to compare these. So normally these must differ by a sign. So there's something out here. Um, I missed the four here. There was this four four. So I must add must add the four here. And then if you add the four, so this one is gonna be eleven out of three. Uh plus one over two n minus uh one over six n squared. Okay, let's write it down, see what how it differs from the other one. Okay, so the integral very likely is just gonna be eleven out of three, and the, uh, the rest will approach zero. Okay, makes sense here. Uh, right, let's look at LPN. We put it from the other side. Um, it's eleven out of three. If you like, you can start by writing the eleven out of three. Right here, easy to compare. Um, minus one over two n minus one over six n squared. Six n squared. What is the square missing here in the U? Okay, I'm the one who just. This is square here, this one. All right, so that's fine.
right this look very very correct so we have found this here the upn and the european normally that is just if one term is just going to be negative and the rest of the terms will be the same so you can see the middle term is the one that is just um, um, negative there in the it's negative in the in the lower one in the lower Riemann sum and it's positive in the upper Riemann sum okay Right, let this be the calculate your P and your PN. We've just done that. All right. Uh, now use your answers uh, in 6.1, 6.2 to prove from first principles that F is Riemann calculable on that. So, hey, so we have the two things the LPN, which is equal to what? Which is uh, uh, this one 11 over 3. Minus one over two n minus one over six n squared. One over two n minus one over six n squared. UPN. Eleven over three plus one over two n minus one over six n squared. Or as a consequence, right? So we can find the limit of this LP now. Limit. It's in approaches infinity of the LPN. Limit is in approaches infinity of 11 out of 3 minus 1 over 2n minus 1 over 6n squared. And this is 11 out of 3 LP. Okay, so, but also we have this one here, which is the limit. But first, we can write UP. And write up. Right, you can write up is the limit is n approaches infinity of upn, which is the limit is n approaches infinity. Of the which is 11 out of 3 plus 1 over 2n minus 1 over 6n squared. Yes, n approaches infinity, which is 11 over 3. Okay. But because now, obviously, then the implication is that hence we can see that these are equal to each other, they're both 11 out of 3. Hence, uh, LPN is equal to U. Uh, no, that's, this is only UP. That is not UPN. Only UP, this one. So, in other words, uh, LP is UP. Right, LP is UP. Is equal to 11 over 3. LP is UP equals 11 over 3. Like that. Um, and thus, F is Riemann. Riemann integrable. Moreover, moreover, it is these things are the integral from zero to one of the minus 
x squared plus 4 dx. Let's use the rules of integration to verify this from first year calculus. Right, the integral of the x squared is minus x cubed. 2 plus 1 is 3, and you divide by 2 plus 1, which is another 3, and then the integral of the 4 is 4x. Four from 0 to 1. Substitute. Minus 1 cubed over 3 plus 4 into 1. 4 minus 1 over 3, what is it? 12 minus, 12 minus 1, 11 out of 3. And this 11 out of 3 is the answer we got. So it is LP, which is equal to UP. Moreover, it means that this integral is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. The integral of from 0 to 1 of f of x dx is equal to the LP UP, which is equal to 11 out of 3. So the function is indeed Riemann integrable. OK, next. OK, it appears that um, we have discussed March. What time did we start? We started it at about half eight, right? <laughs> right, we started at half eight. So it's half ten. We've just done two hours. I did not realize that, but it's okay. Um, right, this concludes our discussion for today. And I'll see you tomorrow. And my wish that is that tomorrow we meet at, you let me know uh, which time is best for you between 1 and 2, 1 and 2 p.m. Because, uh, let me see. Okay, let me say first date this. Um, right, my load shedding is going to be at what time? Mm, the load shedding is going to be at, uh, okay. I think I already got a hint of that uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, zone that. Right, so the load shedding is going to be at 6. It's going to be at 6 p.m. So if we start at half 4, then it's not going to be enough. We're going to run out of 30 minutes. If we start at 3, it will be okay because if you start at three, then you can finish at five. Then it will happen at six. So you can start at three. You can start at two. You can start at one. Please advise me. Uh, can start we start at one o'clock? Yeah, one o'clock is perfect. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so we need just to uh, play around with this, watch this video, take notes. Please always take notes of these things. It's very important that these things you write them down because the skill that when Cultivate is writing the things down. If you write the things down, it's a skill that the exam requires, being able to write the things down. So um, taking the notes, writing these um, in a book, and then um, making sure that one understands the, um, the solutions. And then the next step becomes to close the solutions and see if um, the ability to solve this without looking at the answers is there. And I must indicate that the exam is going to be pretty much of this format. But tomorrow we're bringing new things. Um, and we need to go deeper into a bit more general questions that relate to the exam, but questions in the material, the study guide and the, pres the prescribed textbook. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Um, see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, I have a few more questions. Yes, please. Uh, how many lessons do we have left for math 2613? I remember we said eight lessons. Yeah, we said eight lessons. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to evaluate and, and give you feedback tomorrow at 1 p.m. So I'll have to look back. I'll have to look back and and, 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 and look ahead, you know. And uh, I think today we were supposed to do APM 3711 on, on Thursdays. Yeah, that's the thing. We're supposed to do um, APM 37 on Thursdays. In fact, you're right there, but now we lost track. So um, we can always slot, slot that in tomorrow um, because we have a daily activity. Um, uh, okay, that's fine. 
we can do it tomorrow. Yeah, we can do it. Yeah, we can do it tomorrow because we're supposed to do it today on Thursday. So otherwise, I mean, it's, 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 it's left behind. Um, the truth is, we really are doing very well when it comes to this module. But now, um, two six one three, there are a couple of the, the things that we need to do. Um, would be just the series. Um, we need to do more questions on series. Why? Because, but just that the the questions on series will not be very diverse. Uh, but it's very important that uh, obviously we are very compatible when it comes to dealing with any question on series. Um, the ability to to choose an appropriate test for convergence is very important. Um, because given a series. You need to know what test to use. It's not always obvious because it's not always the ratio test that works. Um, sometimes the ratio test fails. Like in this module, by and large, the first question always require the vanishing condition. And then the second question will normally require um, the limit comparison test. And the third series question will normally require um, the integral test. Um, and then you have the radius of convergence question um, on series. That radius of convergence question always require um, the ratio test. So that has been the pattern, but it's very important that we solve a bit more questions so that you can be more comfortable. But also after having solved more questions, it's important to, um, to give you exercises that can be marked. And, and I can see for myself because I need to, I need to be sure of the, the level of preparation. And now sometimes this ability to solve this is done through a bit more questions. Okay, we will discuss that. Uh, please, at, um, yeah, tomorrow at one p.m. I, I, I will, I will look back and give you feedback on uh, content coverage. We've gone through the topics, but we still have to play around with general questions. We have seen the exam structure. We have gone through the exam questions that are popular. My expectation therefore is much is much familiarity now with the content, but can any question be solved on series? Okay, series are the most important part of this course. Um, um, the tests for convergence are very important, the P series and, and, and whatnot. But it will help to solve a good number of the questions. Where will the questions come from? From a prescribed textbook in the study guide. Okay, I'm going to give you more information tomorrow. <laughs> okay, thanks. Have a good evening. Okay, goodbye.